Welcome to First Contact Stories of the Call Center. I'm your host, Christian Montez, where we dive into the lives that connect us all, one call at a time, revealing the stories behind the leaders' transformative journeys in the contact center world. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of First Contact Stories of the Call Center. I'm Christian Montez, your guide, as we go through the journey of these remarkable stories of CX and contact center leaders. Now, look, for today's episode, I'm super excited to have Milan Batanis. He's a dynamic speaker, a coach, an entrepreneur who's actually really passionate about helping others find joy, energy, passion, peace, and purpose. Now, look, if that spelled something, it's because it does. It spells JEP. And that's something that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. But with Milan, we're going to talk about that wealth of experience in the operational roles and the sales roles that really has helped him look at his career and work with companies from startups, Fortune 100 enterprises, and really been able to be a powerful advocate for employee engagement and professional fulfillment. So we're going to be uncovering Milan's insights into the finding of meaningful work, explore how the latest industry trends are really going to be reshaping the employee engagement, and then learn about how technological innovations are really going to be shaping the call center landscape. It's going to be really important that we talk about Milan's journey and how we talk about wellness, financial and professional goals, and how that really is going to fuel the approach to leadership and coaching. So remember, let's get ready for an inspiring conversation where we're going to give you fresh ideas on how to motivate teams, retain top talent, and find purpose in work. So let's dive in. Milan, excited to have you. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, look, I love this beginning part of our show because we always talk about this idea of how did we get into the industry? And we say, yeah, I didn't wake up when I was a kid and go, one day when I grow up, I'm going to be in the contact center industry. That's usually not how it goes. We have a story that goes, yeah, I got in here somehow and I've been stuck the whole time or I'm living the dream as we talked about. So With that, let's talk about how did you get here? What were those moments and those events that guided you to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way to start this off. Um, So, yeah, I was not growing up in middle school, high school. I wasn't, you know, one of those folks that said, I can't wait to run a contact center one day. I'm so totally looking forward to that. Um, So my passion was always meteorology. I love storms. I love weather. Uh, But in high school and college, I was extremely shy. So I ended up, uh, while I was in college, I ended up taking a job in a contact center where I had to talk on the phone with people. I hated talking on the phone with other people um, to try to get out of my comfort zone. Because I'm like, hey, if I'm going to work, you know, in this type of role where I'm on TV or on the radio or whatever it might be, I need to break out of my shell. So I took a job and that was my first job in a contact center. I was 19 years old, took a job in a contact center and uh, I never looked back. And that was 20 20 plus years ago. So, um, so yeah, so I took a job in a contact center just to break out of my shell. Then I went into a sales contact center. So inbound retention, inbound sales for American Express. And, um, and again, that was just because I was like, all right, now that I can talk on the phone with people, let me see if I can learn how to sell something. (laughs) And then I was like, wow, I really enjoy this. This is so much fun. And that's, that's, you know, kind of how I, I got to this place. Uh, Luckily, contact center um, industry and, and operations, the sales management. I got into the recruitment uh, firm world by recruiting specifically for contact centers and technologies that provide their uh, software to contact centers. Uh, so, yeah, so it kind of all started with, hey, I'm a shy 19 year old that wants to become uncomfortable or break out of a shell. So let me take a job answering calls all day and see how that goes. So it's interesting because a lot of people that start that first day and they go into the contact center. It's such a different experience. And and for some people, it's like, nope, you turn, I'm out the door. And other people, it's like a challenge or you're going, no, I need this, right? I need the money or I'm, I'm, I'm getting through college or, you know, like you, you had this mission of I had to break out of my shell. I had to do something disruptive and uncomfortable because that change was going to be transformative to what you were going to do. Did you anticipate at that moment that it was actually going to give you that need of feeling like you could get out of your shell or was it going to be like oh no that reinforces how i can't do this this is too hard or too scary what was that piece of you that says i'm going to get through this initial pain 
because it's going to be worth it? Or what was your, the, the thing going through your mind that got you through that? Because that first experience couldn't have been easy. No. So actually, that's a great question. So after my first week, I remember I started on a Monday and Friday night or Saturday, I t- told my parents, I called my parents up and I said, listen, I said, nope. I said, I'm drinking from a fire hose. I said, I have a full class load. I said, there's no way I'm going to stick with this. And my parents actually were the ones that were like, listen, they're like, this was week one of training. Give it a week at a time and see, see after the second week, like, let's give it one more week and see how you feel after the second week. And um, I was like, fine, I'll give it one more week. And I went into the second week thinking, hey, this is my last week. So I started looking for other jobs again, like on campus. <laughs> yep. Because I'm like, this is not, you know, my parents said, give it one more week. That's all I'm going to do. And then during that second week, probably the Tuesday or Wednesday of that second week, like something like clicked in the training. And I'm like, oh, I, I understand what I'm being taught now. Like, and then I just gave it another week and another week. And then after the month long training, I was like, okay. Let me, let me stick with it a little bit longer. And I still wasn't convinced. I was still thinking, you know, I'll give it a month and see how it goes. I'll give it to the end of semester and see how it goes. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this, this isn't as bad as I thought. It's like, uh, you know, this isn't causing physical harm to me (laughs) or anything like that. Talking on the phone with other people and helping them answer their questions. So it's, it's interesting how in your career you've gone from, I'm going to use this as a, a, a platform to go on to what I really want to do, right? And then you have worked in a variety of sizes of contact centers and a variety of different roles. And then now you're running your own business, but not running a contact center. So kind of talk to me about the two pivots, right? That pivot of the moment saying, I'm not going to go into uh, what you studied in meteorology, and focusing, saying, this is what I'm going to make a career out of. I'm not going to use it as a platform to pivot uh, unless there is something that you're doing in the back end. Love to kind of understand that dynamic. But then what made you go from working for somebody else to saying, now it's time for me to work for myself? Yeah. Oh, man, you, you have the great questions today. So I would say <clears throat> I would say in, in school, in college and even post-college, uh, just the idea, you know, I, I was in a sales contact center. And for, there was something about the challenge, and I loved the challenge of uh, working in sales, of being rejected, and then trying to find ways to overcome those objections and finding ways. So I, so I really, really loved being challenged. So that's kind of what really helped me make that pivot. Like, I'm not going to be a meteorologist. I'm going to work in sales. And it just so happened to be in the contact center uh, world. Um, now to this day for fun as a hobby, I still chase storms. So this time of year, I'm still driving around looking for tornadoes and things like that, chasing storms, but as a hobby, not as a career. Um, and then, uh, you know, I started speaking, uh, I think it was 2018 or 2019 and on employee engagement and human behaviors. And I know we'll talk more about that, but, Mm -hmm. uh, I was also working for a BPO. So I was working in sales for a BPO, sales for a recruitment firm that recruited four contact centers. And I was doing speaking kind of on the side. Started my company a little over a year ago, but was doing that as, you know, a side hustle. And then um, and then decided, you know what, I would just love to do this full time. And it, it got to the point where uh, I just kind of had to take the leap. Kind of, kind of like going back to that second week in my first contact center role. I was just like, I love the security of the, my corporate job. I always told myself I would never take a commission only job, but there's something different when I'm, you know, I'm pretty much commission only, but I'm working for myself. So I just decided, you know what, March of 2023, here's my one month notice to my corporate job. And, uh, and I said, I'm just going to go out on my own. And, you know, the people asked at my organization, I was there almost six years. They asked, they said, so how are you going to actually monetize this and make a living? I'm like, ah, it's a challenge. I'll figure it out as I go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, so far in my first year, that's what I've done. <laughs> Fantastic. So, you know, a lot of the things have, that we're talking about, you've kind of find things that there was a passion for, a joy for, something that you felt that challenge, the sense of fulfillment. So I kind of want to shift the conversation now towards joy, right? We talk about joy a lot in a variety of ways. And sometimes it's like superficial. It's this thing on the side. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's joy too, but I got to work, right? I got to, you know, pay the bills. I got to, you know, keep my house or send my kids to school, whatever it is that you're, you're working for, your purpose. But when we focus on the term joy, sometimes it can be elusive because of all the things we just talked about, those daily challenges and those grinds that, that, that we deal with. 
So in your experience, what are those fundamental principles or mindset shifts that are really necessary for you to be able to cultivate that sense of joy and fulfillment in the professional life, uh, uh, knowing that there's all these demanding and unforeseen challenges? Yeah, great. Um, I, I think I think when we talk about joy in the workplace or doing work that brings you joy or that you develop joy in doing that type of work, because uh, obviously I didn't have joy day one of working in sales or day one of working in a contact center. Um, I think really joy is more of a, a ancillary benefit of what you just brought up, fulfillment. So figuring out the type of work that energizes you. So when, when we do work that we enjoy, it gives us energy. And we're energized by the work. That's where some people can work 12 hours in a day and it doesn't phase them. They want to just keep working because the, the work they do is energizing to them. And then the opposite is true. When people do work that is not a good fit for who they are, their energy gets drained. So there is certain parts of running in my own business that are draining. Anytime I need to log into QuickBooks or do any like paperwork type of stuff, <laughs> I am not joyful during those times. I, I don't have, I don't gain energy. I, my energy is drained. Um, but at the end of the day, if if I'm doing work, as you said, fulfilling, if I'm doing work that really, um, really drives my internal purpose, you know, whatever my purpose is in the work that I do and helping others, um, as long as I understand like, hey, I'm fulfilling this purpose, um, joy just kind of comes along with that. And like I said, you're not going to have joy in every single task you do. Like I said, there's days when I don't feel the joy of the work that I'm doing, but then there's other days that really refill my my cup of energy and fulfillment and purpose um, because I'm doing well what I love to do. Um, so it kind of, I, I would say as long as your majority of your time, majority of your effort is being put towards fulfilling your purpose or doing work that's fulfilling to you, then you'll experience that joy. But even now, uh, and I'm a, uh, you know, I preach Jeff and I preach about joy and things about like things like that. Um, but you're not going to have joy every moment of every day during your work day. Um, but the goal is to have it for the majority of the time and that you're doing work that is fulfilling and energizing to you. And uh, because of that, you'll you'll experience joy and joy in the workplace, happiness in the workplace. You'll be more engaged in the work that you do. You know, you, you brought up Jeff, and I want to go to that next, but I want to just put one little note on your commentary around joy, right, and fulfillment. And it's interesting because some of us, you know, initially we can look at our jobs and say, well, maybe I don't always have a majority of joy or there's not an easy way to find joy in the job, right? And so that means sometimes people are stuck in a job or, you know, that's the job that maybe they feel is the only one they can do at the time or whatever it is, maybe they are looking for other work. And so sometimes that joy may not always be the fact that what they're doing is joyful or they can find that, that feeling um, of fulfillment. But then is there a way when someone is in a job right now that there isn't that joy to be able to say, while I'm here, how do I create joy from fulfilling something else that maybe the job enables? So like as an example, that job may enable you to learn something new while you're there, even though there's other things that may not be ideal. Maybe it's helping you uh, pay off a car or get your first house or whatever it is, these, these kind of little goals that you can have in that moment to say, this is a step towards the next step, but there is still some sense of fulfillment or is it just until you find the job, is it not really your ability to feel fulfilled? How do you help or um, engage people with that side so they can do their best and be their best version while they are somewhere that may not be ideal yet. Yeah, exactly how you described it. So figuring out based on, you know, what motivates them, how they can focus on those areas. So, you know, some people really want to be challenged, so they may not feel like the job is the right fit or that career might not be the right fit. But okay, how can I challenge myself to go above and beyond or to do better? Because that'll be more fulfilling for me. Or if it's saving up for a down payment for a house or paying off a car. Um, or if it's, you know, I, I'm somebody who uh, loves to continually learn. So if I'm in a job where I'm just like, I don't think this is the right fit. Yeah, how can I learn other skills or other abilities or learn more about the industry? Um, because that'll be fulfilling. So even though I may not enjoy the job, also have fulfillment in other areas within the job because I'm, you know, I, I'm hitting on or touching on one of my motivations. 
Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So let's kind of shift then to Jeff, right? So joy, energy, passion, peace, and purpose. Why those specific words? I know we've covered joy and a little bit yeah. of energy, but why that in work and how does that philosophy really impact how one would lead a team, be in a team, or be inspired or inspire others? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I kind of started Jeff with the whole purpose and, uh, and energy. You know, the whole idea around if you do work that you enjoy, you'll be energized by it. If you do work that you don't enjoy, it'll drain your energy. So kind of launching or using energy as the launch pad into, okay, in order for me to do fulfilling work, you know, what is my purpose? What is it that I want to accomplish? How do I, not only what do I want to accomplish, what am I passionate about, but then also um, how can I have a greater impact or how do I want to have a greater impact through the work that I do? Um and where I don't have the Sunday night blues. So that's where peace comes in. It's like, you know, you have, I, I had a job before where every Sunday night I was in a foul mood and I dreaded, I hated Sunday nights because I was dreading Monday morning. Um, and so, you know, being able to figure out, okay, I understand this type of work. So like for me, uh, speaking energizes me. I can get on stage for five minutes and that gives me enough energy for like a whole week. It's insane. Um, and if I'm speaking about something that is fulfilling my purpose, I have peace about it because I'm doing work that I enjoy and um, and I'm very passionate uh, about it. So I think once people can figure out, and sometimes it takes longer for individuals than it does for others to figure out, okay, what type of work energizes me? And it doesn't have to be a specific industry or a specific quote unquote job. It doesn't have to be like, I must be a director of operations of a contact center. It could just be, uh, maybe a, a specific type of uh, industry. Maybe it's like, hey, I really want to help out a nonprofit, uh, maybe a specific type of nonprofit. And it's like, okay, within the, this nonprofit, how can I have the greatest impact? And maybe that's really what drives that person uh, that around their purpose. Um, or it could be a specific job. Maybe the industry doesn't matter. And it's like, I really want to be a sales manager. I really would enjoy helping other salespeople, sales leaders develop into like their next role and help people become leaders. Um, so it's really understanding, okay, not only what is en what energizes me, what's fulfilling for me, but then how can I impact others? And as if the people that are listening to this, watching this are really focused on developing others, it's looking at, okay, how can I have the greatest impact while still being energized, while still doing work that I enjoy? Like, like again, for me, in addition to speaking, I love training others on either JEP or how they can be a better leader, do more within their career, because for me, that's fulfilling, helping others, you know, get to the next level or get to the next step in their career. Yeah, it's interesting as I'm listening to how you articulate each word, how purpose is the last word, but so many companies and leaders for the teams that are in the trenches, the closest to the customer, the closest to uh, being able to make an impact of someone's journey with that brand uh, or business, many times aren't really aligned or understand their purpose. Individually, how do they contribute every day to making or breaking that relationship, building it up or breaking it down? And when people don't have purpose and they don't understand their role and the impact that them individually have every day to make a moment special or to ruin a relationship, um, and that could be even in a technical role, a non-customer facing role, every department does something that affects another person somewhere because there's very few companies that have zero employees, right? There's something that's affecting somebody at some point that when you have that purpose, can you find a way to be passionate about your purpose, about what it is you do? Are you going to put energy behind it? Can you find joy in what you're doing now that you have some energy and some passion towards a purpose? And that should right create moments of peace, that that uncertainty or that lack of knowing where and how your energy is being invested. So I think it's awesome how you've kind of wrapped that together and put it in. And you've kind of said a little bit right about your joy, your passion in speaking, right, and in coaching. So how is that, though, for you? I know you said that investing in others, helping others is one of your cup fillers. But how has that really shaped your perspective of how organizations could be successful? And what are those 
experiences that you've had to say, wow, working with all these companies and all these industries, here's something that speaking and coaching has taught me about success or helping people be successful outside of it, obviously being fulfilling for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me, I had a leader that was in my life, a mentor that I worked for for several years that really instilled uh, the platinum role uh, into me. And, you know, I, when I first got into a leadership role in a contact center, I had a director above me um, that probably wasn't, didn't give me the greatest advice now that I look back on it. His, uh, his advice was, listen, you're a new manager and you're going to develop a management style. And he said, your agents, your people will adapt to your management style. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, I was new in leadership. I'm like, that sounds great. I'm just going to develop the style. People will adapt to me. Well, obviously you already can tell that doesn't work. (laughs) Um, And then I had a leader shortly after that that said, you know, the golden rule is treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, He said, what if you take it a step further and treat others the way they want to be treated, utilizing the platinum rule and really modifying your behavior to fit each person that you're managing or coaching? And really, that's for me in my career, that's been the biggest game changer. He gave me that advice almost 10 years ago. And in the last 10 years, I just try to utilize that in all of my relationships when I coach people, uh, when I'm mentoring, uh, different things like that, leading others is okay. I understand I want to be treated a certain way. Like I love to be challenged. I love to have variety in my work. I am not detail oriented or at all, you know, but then I understand if I understand other people, then I know like, okay, this person needs the details. This person does not need to be challenged. This person, you know, what does this person need? And, and, uh, I can't remember uh, who said it, um, or which author, but, uh, but it, it said in a book, Oh, Marcus Buckingham. Um, and in one of his books, he said that, uh, you know, you need to treat others the way that they want to be treated in order to be a successful leader. And uh, and he said, it's really easy to figure out what others need and others want. He said, it's a three letter word, ask. So it's just ask them, ask people what they need or what they want from you, what their expectation is from you. And then you can adapt for that person. I always tell people it's like a relationship. Uh, you know, Christian, if I know what you need and you know what I need, if we both adapt a little bit to each other, we meet in the middle and uh, it's like any other relationship in life. Uh, but, you know, being able to ask people how they want to be treated and then treating people the way they want to be treated is very, very simple. This is James. James is a contact center manager with a passion for philosophy and hiking. As a kid, he made a promise to himself that he would always follow his passion. Today, he ponders on the thought that this promise is probably the best decision he ever made. Today, James loves his job just as much as he loves hiking. So much that he sometimes brings the scent of fresh pine and the tranquility of the mountain streams back to the office with him. With Nobel Biz as his company's provider, James found the necessary peace of mind to finally bridge the gap between his passion and his work. By choosing to partner with the promise-keeping voice and software provider of the industry, contact center technical issues, downtime, and poor customer experience are now a thing of the past. In an industry ruled by uncertainty, Nobel Biz combines balanced pricing with the highest quality topped off with outstanding support. But above all, Nobel Biz delivers peace of mind to contact center managers and owners. And for the first time, James hit that sweet spot of focus and confidence that is allowing him to take his business to new heights of profitability and success. After all, you know what they say, promises are the uniquely human way of ordering the future. Nobel Biz, the promise keepers of the industry.
Yeah, it's interesting how you know I've heard a lot of that same idea of how the, the golden rule is a little selfish, right? It's a little bit about what I want, right? It's not about the other person. So it's counterintuitive to the idea that if what you're doing is for others, then why are you using yourself as the only reflection of what that should look like? And what's interesting with the platinum rule um, that you, you're talking about is, you know, it, it, it also looks at being genuine, right? Is I'm genuinely interested in understanding what it is that you want. I'm not sitting there looking at it from something of me doing something at you. I'm looking at now doing something with you. And that dynamic that you're talking about is awesome because there's so many people that unfortunately, you know, they're the smartest person in the room and that always is the case. And there isn't a way to really get breathing room for others to sit there and go, well, there is something important that you're really missing that that other person would want. And it's really great that you've not only taken that, but you've invested it honestly into what you do every day. Cause you have been listening to you and you're always talking about how you want to do something for others, how you want to fill your cup by filling others cups. And uh, that's part of your mission and it, it shows. So it's great. Now, when we talk about your expertise and your experience, right, it's pretty broad and you've had a lot of roles that we've talked about. We talk about employee engagement, right? And that employee engagement is really not only evolving, but it's critical that some people say for it to be there without it, you're going to have a lot of problems. Can you kind of talk about from a contact center industry perspective, what are those challenges that you think leaders um, need to prioritize or manage through so that employee engagement is actually front and center? And the second piece is, is employee engagement really that important? Do you really need to focus on it as much? Or is it kind of a thing you do because you got to do it, but it's really not the, the priority? Oh, man. Oh, man, that is a loaded question. I'm going to start with the second part first. Yes, and absolutely, employee engagement is vital and it's necessary. And I'm not just saying that because I talk about employee engagement all the time, I, but I absolutely believe it. Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about it all the time. Um, you know, I, I believe that in order for a contact center agent to give a great experience, you know, a great CX or provide great CX, they need to be engaged in the work that they do. And they need to be engaged in the company, in their management team, in their uh, colleagues in their own team, uh, they need to have that engagement in all those different aspects in the organizational culture. Um, uh, be otherwise, it's gonna it's gonna show in their in how they correspond with a uh, customer with a client. They're they're gonna provide uh, I would say lesser, um, not only lesser CX to the customer, but then they're with their disengagement that also leads to higher attrition. So then you have agents that are, have less tenure. Um, so yeah, I, I believe, you know, in order to keep a solid workforce within the contact center to um, make sure you have the tribal knowledge, to make sure you have a, a tenured agents that are doing and providing good CX, you have to focus on employee engagement. I, I would say if you're gonna focus on employee engagement, even more so than certain KPIs, I think the KPIs will work themselves out if your employees are are engaged and, and again going back to the previous part of our conversation finding out you know how to engage your employees is again just figuring out what is motivating your employees well what's i mean like when i worked for american express we were inbound business retention so it was business american express card holders calling to cancel uh, and my team's responsibility was to show them the value in the product and convince them to keep their account open and use their uh, Amex card. Um, so it's really understanding, okay, like what is enticing as a, as an agent? Yes, it could be money and some of those external factors, but what is the, what, what, why do you uh, show up every day? Why do you try to do a good job? Why do you try to help the card member, uh, you know, spend more money on the card? Why are you trying to help American Express make more money? Um, so why, why are you, you know, what's your why? And you know, what's really driving you? And I'm, I'm going to say it here. I know everybody else has probably said it, but pizza parties, Starbucks gift cards is not employee engagement. Beanbag chairs. I went into one office once outside of Boston and they had scooters. People can like ride around the office. They had beanbag chairs and their little cafeteria or lunchroom. They had a pool table and a ping pong table. And what's funny is over the pool table, they had plexiglass. And I said, why do you guys have plexiglass over the pool table? 
And so we use it as a cafeteria table because after the first week, nobody ever played pool again. So we just made it into another cafeteria table because they thought, they thought having all these scenes would engage their employees. But no, it did for maybe a few days. And then afterwards, um, they said the only thing they still use are the beanbag chairs. They had beer and wine on tap, but it was being used so little, the beer kept going stale. So they had to switch out the kegs. Um, yeah, that's not really going to engage employees long term. Like when you talk to somebody, you know, why, why'd you stay at your job for 30 years? It's not going to be because there's a ping pong table in the, in the lunchroom. It was because of the way I was treated. It was because I was doing work that was fulfilling to me and, and my manager, my manager treated me well. That's why I stayed so long. And that's why I really enjoyed the work that I was doing there. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's interesting how a lot of companies will dangle shiny objects and carrots in ways where it's not really driving behavior outcomes, right? And so the employee engagement, you know, there's, you know, the old sayings, I'm going to butcher it, but it's like happy employees make happy customers. And so the, the, the end goal, right, is that both parties have a positive outcome, right? Or a more positive outcome or driving towards better outcomes. And, you know, having one without the other just may not work. And so if, the ping pong table or the pool table isn't driving towards a happier customer experience because the employee is happier, uh, then like you said, right, it becomes a, a cafeteria table and it really doesn't give the value. And so I think a lot of times people will sit there and look short term and just say this quick fix, this band aid, is what is going to create employee engagement. And they confuse what it actually means. And so um, I'm glad that you're able to put into that context to say, Here's some examples of what's not employee engagement that people say is employee engagement, right? And I think a lot of it has gone back to what you said around purpose, right? What is What are you doing? Are you getting fulfillment? So a lot of the JEP stuff in there um, is still really critical. Now, we all know that contact centers have uh, a lot of turnover, some more than others, and certain types of contact centers have a lot more turnover than others. Um, internal contact centers or outsourcers. So when you think of these organizations, what is it that you think that you see what they do well versus what they should probably stop doing when it comes to their hiring and retention strategies? Because we know that getting the right employees and then keeping them engaged and having them there longer is better for all kinds of reasons for not only reducing turnover, but it's expensive to hire people. So can you give some insights around that dynamic? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think what from a hiring perspective, what the contact center should do is make the process as easy as possible, especially when you see the average contact center in the U.S. Average contact center attrition rate is 37 percent annually, 33 to 37 percent. Having three, four, or five interviews, having all these assessments to prove their uh, hard skills, um, to prove their soft skills, um, I think it's a, a little bit extreme. Especially, you're still you're not lowering the attrition rates, the turnover rates uh, by any means. So, I think streamlining the process and making it a bit more simpler for an agent or an entry level employee to be hired on, um, and giving them giving more people a shot. So. It, what I'm saying is take you're taking a greater risk in when you're hiring those types of folks. But again, if you're already at almost 40% attrition with your very long uh, interview uh, process and, and a lot of companies, uh, you know, I, I was in uh, Austin, Texas last week and I heard a statistic where somebody said uh, of, of the times people ghost one another in the hiring process, 70% of the time it's from the recruiter side because the process is taking so long to get people through the interview process, applicants move on to other organizations because they're like, well, this is how it is during my interview process. What will it be like if I get hired on? You know, I had my first interview. I haven't heard from anybody in two weeks, but they said they want to interview me again. You know, how is the communication within the organization? A lot of, a lot of times people will take that as an indication as to the culture and how the organization will treat them once they're hired on. So like if I interview today, and then you say after the interview, hey, I want to interview you again, or I want you to meet with my manager for your second interview. But then two weeks goes by, you know, so really being quick with candidates and streamlining the process and following up, following through, you know, if you tell somebody like, hey, I'm going to move you on to the next interview, like be communicative with them and continue to communicate what the process looks like. If it is going to be a couple of weeks, just let them know. So that way they're giving a heads up. And then um, 
but with with retaining and what not to do well i kind of already said it don't don't with hiring don't uh, ghost them don't make them wait a long time they'll have a lot of steps in the process um and then on the uh, retaining side i think again you know focusing on the engagement there was some io psychologist that did some studies and found there's four forces within a organization that disengaged somebody and none of them were paid uh, which is interesting it was poor job fit or misalignments maybe they were told during the interview you're going to do x and then we start doing the job you're not doing x you're doing y and they're like well wait a second i thought i was hired to do this um which would be my job but now you're having me do this instead uh the second is uh manager fit so is the manager not treating the employee the way they need to be um team dynamics so how how does everybody gel together as a team uh, anytime you add somebody to a team or remove somebody from a team, it changes the whole team dynamic. Uh, and then the fourth is the overall organization and, uh, you know, organizational culture. Uh, and will the person be a good fit for that? And I'm not going to get into generations. There's been so many studies done around generations, but it's different for every generation too. You know, what drives somebody, uh, you know, I, I just talked to somebody this morning. Um, they just graduated college, what, last spring? So they're 23 years old. And asking them, like, what motivates you and what motivates them is far different from people that I talk to that are like 55 years old, which, which is really interesting. But like what what is motivating to them is uh, has been very different from my experience. So so really just making sure you're engaging folks and making sure that everything's in alignment, that what pretty much long story short, um, follow through and do what you say you're going to do or, uh, you know, the type of job you're hiring somebody for. Let them do that job. Yeah, so much to unpack there. And it's interesting how uh, I think uh, maybe a few weeks ago, you had posted something on LinkedIn and you were talking about the idea of, you know, not only being ghosted, but the poor experience people have when they're going through the job hunt and how a lot of either recruiters or HR departments and businesses that are looking for new uh, employees uh, just really have a poor process or poor experience. And I always find it funny how we talk about, you know, you have your external customer, you have your internal customer and your internal customer is your staff. And it's funny to me how they use the word customer, because then I sit there and I go, do you treat your customers like that? So if you're if, if, if your business right is the business of selling someone a product or a service, do you not really tell them how they're going to get it installed and set up when you're going to do delivery? You know what their journey is going to look like when they're going to get these things and value is going to happen. Like, do you really just not communicate or give them the like, well, you are fortunate enough today to be allowed the ability to apply for us. And if you earn your right to be able to talk to us, then we will let you know that when we feel it's good. Right. Who no would have customers if you did that. But it's interesting how. We try to say culturally, we're great with employees and employees are our best customer and, you know, their most important asset. But during the hiring process, you're sure as heck not a customer. You're, you're, you're some transactional thing that very few people actually want to spend time on or have the right resources to do. So we could have a whole nother episode and we might even have to have it around that. But I had to say it because you were posting it the other day and I'm going, yes. Yes, that's so true. <laughs> well, and, and I know we'll talk uh, innovation and technology, and I, I am not saying that I do not like AI. I like AI, but I've heard so many horror stories of, you know, I, pre I send my resume in and the algorithm sent me a rejection five minutes after I applied. But then when I knew somebody that worked there and sent my resume through an internal employee, I got the job. And it's like, well, this algorithm, how many qualified people or good candidates is the algorithms or is AI just rejecting automatically because of poor formatting or not picking up on the specific words on their resume. And then that's what kind of led to that post was, you know, somebody I know got hired at Meta in Texas and she had applied three times and her resume every time, but new resume got rejected. And then through a mutual friend, they knew so they were worked at Meta or something and she sent it in that way to HR and now she's working at Meta because of that, but it was the same person, nothing changed from the first time she applied to the last time she got the job. So yeah, so like just- Yeah, well, a, a perfect example of your network being your net worth, right? It, yeah. It, yes. it, it, essentially, it's, you know, the old, you know, phrase, it's who, it's who you know. And and, yeah. and, and, and and you know, that's why networking is so important because without it, many times, unfortunately, transactionally, you are just another thing. but. Let's kind of talk about AI now that we've kind of brought up the topic and it's a great segue into what we want to talk about is 
we see this just insane amount of bombardment from AI. And AI means so many things to so many people. And there are so many things that people don't even know how to use AI for or what its purpose or what its ROI is. And when we talk about voice bots and chat bots, and we're talking about all kinds of things of AI in the front office, back office, let's just kind of distill this down to what are you seeing as the future of where people are actually using AI in a useful, productive, helpful manner towards the things that we've talked about today? And the things you're going like, yeah, you're missing the mark. You just saw the shiny object and plugged it in and it's making more harm than good. Can you kind of talk about what you're seeing and then separate from that, how is that impacting, if at all, that human touch that people want or need in certain scenarios? Yeah, so I think I think AI, from what I've seen in the contact center industry, I think AI is really beneficial, especially for those quick transactional, uh, easy to answer, where I don't need empathy type of interactions. You know, if I need to reach out to my local Target store to figure out like, hey, do you have this in stock? Like, I don't need empathy. I don't need to talk to somebody. Can AI, can a computer, can a chatbot tell me that? Yes. Or what time are you open till or, or something like that? Something easy. But if, you know, if my flight got canceled to Boston or something, I'd I want to talk to somebody versus like, you know, a AI can't really, from what I've seen, and I know things is progressing. It's probably by the time this uh, airs, it will probably have progressed. So this will be null and void. <laughs> But, you know, AI being able to show empathy versus just, you know, following a script that was inputted. So having that um, uh, learning capability where if I say, hey, you know, I was going to Boston for a weekend for a wedding. My flight get, got canceled. And now it looks like I'll miss the wedding. So there's no point in me even going, um, you know, having a chatbot say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that isn't the same as a human being saying, oh, I'm so sorry. Let me see how I can help you. Let me see what I can do. You know, so I, I think cases where you need to have that human touch, that that empathy, um, that, that's kind of where it's missing uh, on the AI side. I think from a from an outsourcing perspective, I think um, a lot of companies that do outsource or utilize BPOs, I think BPOs, if they're utilizing AI for like, say, a digital agent will be very beneficial for organizations long term because they can mix that whole you know, human touch versus AI and brands themselves can do that as well. Where the, and so I think it'll be a big cost saver. I just hope companies kind of evaluate, you know, is, am I saving enough money or is saving the money worth the CSATs or the NPS? Because if I save a million dollars a year on contact center costs, but I'm losing $10 million a year in revenue because of poor CX, because I've automated or utilized AI. Well, it doesn't make sense. The ROI isn't there. But if I'm saving a million dollars and I'm making more money or I'm not losing any money, well, then it may be beneficial. But I think, I think for those more difficult transactions or interactions that require empathy, um, I mean, I'm still of the belief, the, the human touch, because even if, even if a chatbot told me, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. No, I want more. I want more. I want you to empathize with me even on a deeper human level. Like, <laughs> like my whole plans for the weekend changed because of this. Uh, so please uh, show me more empathy. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting, right? When the chatbot says, Milan, while we wait, here's a link of some storms near you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Like, well, we understand you're going to miss the wedding, but have you seen the storm that is brewing in the Northeast? So you might as well go to Boston anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's like, so here's the reason you can't get on the plane. But while you're yeah. stuck in that town, here's the nearest storm you can chase. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what's interesting about what you're saying about that is that, you know, we think about the, the, the fact that a lot of times we don't always know what we need when we ask for things. And especially yeah. when we're upset or emotional about something, we want that feeling of being heard first. And then we want our problem resolved as quickly as possible. And then when it gets resolved better than we anticipated or expected, then we can maybe be turned into a champion, right? Turned into that. So until AI in those more complex, emotional engagements can anticipate and understand what you're actually dealing with what you were your real issue is um, I think there's still going to be a need not only for the humans but for AI to help 
humans in real time and in coaching post you know engagement for those scenarios but yeah if you can automate things that um i don't need to talk to a person i can do it on an app i can do it on uh, my phone i can do it on the computer uh, i can do it via some self-service manner that fits conveniently when and where and how i want to engage then yeah there's totally a place for it but i think you're spot on is you're still gonna have to find out those places where the human being should be there and don't make it so impossibly hard to get to that human being where people just give up and they do what you said you saved a million bucks but then you're losing 10 million in a really crappy cx right right yeah and and from a technology perspective and and maybe companies are communicating this better but the last couple of conferences i've been to um we, i was at one last week in austin uh, benchmark portals which is a context center conference you know the exhibitors Oh, what do you do? Oh, we utilize AI. <laughs> Go to the next booth. What do you do? We utilize AI. Like, that's great that everyone's utilizing AI, but how? How, if I'm running a contact center, how is you utilizing AI going to help me? In what way? What is the benefit? Well, how are, how, you know, you go to a conference and it's like AI, 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 AI. It's like, that's wonderful. But like, how? Like, how is that a game changer? Or how is it going to affect my center positively? How is it going to make a positive impact for me or for my customers, for my employees? Um, Versus like, oh, we utilize AI. Like, I think last year, everybody said we utilize AI to sound cutting edge. But now everybody you seems to utilize AI. So now it's like, okay, let's take it a step further. I mean, how is that going to be a benefit? <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. Every show I've been to has been the exact same thing. And I think even uh, online, the discussion's always been like, stop looking at the shiny object because AI is that next cool thing. And if you don't do AI, whatever that means in context, right, is you're going to be left behind. A lot of people in contact centers don't even have people that know enough about AI to say, here's that first place that I'm going to go learn and implement, become a subject matter expert, and then test where it's safe, how to become an expert in implementing this stuff, learning what the ROI is, understanding the benefits to all involved, and then rolling that out to more complex things. Instead, it's like, no, we got to replace agents or we got to immediately use this bot to just do it all. Right. And we're going to save all this money and there's gonna be rainbows and ponies and who knows what else. Right. And it's just funny to me because I sit there and I go, okay, so how are you going to do that? What's, what's the use case and what is the outcome that you're seeing? And a lot of times it's crickets <laughs> or it goes back to, but it's AI. <laughs> Right. It's AI. It's the, like you said, it's the new shiny object. You know, a, a friend of mine told me he got into the contact center industry in 1990. Mm -hmm. And when he got into the contact center industry, he was told by Y2K, IVRs would be obsolete <laughs> because of technology. And here we are in 2024, I guess what still exists. So, so it'll be interesting because some uh, other people have asked me too, like, oh, well, AI and will um, automation replace actual human agents? And I'm like, I don't think I don't think it'll ever happen 100%. It may reduce some of the interactions, um, but no, I don't see it. You know, I like that friend that said, you know, in 1990 by 2000, IVRs would be obsolete. I think it'll be the same thing. Some people think humans will be human. No, human um, agents will be obsolete down the road. I don't think that'll ever happen because especially, I, th I think there'll always be use cases of, you know, if, if somebody steals my credit card information, there's no way I'm going to talk to AI about that. I need a human that can take action and do something now. Like if there's fraudulent activity happening, I need to talk to somebody. Like I will envision being like, oh, talk to our robot. <laughs> yeah, well, who knows what the future holds, right? But I think at the same time right now, we have to say um, we're not there yet. So what do we do in the meantime versus just spending money for the sake of it to fill that checklist that says I in I implemented AI. Okay. What, what has that done for you? Um, so let's kind of, kind of shift a little bit to just overall trends industry wise. You know, when we talk about, you know, what do you think is going to have the most significant impact on businesses in the near future? And really, how do you see how those businesses are going to start preparing? Is it AI or are you seeing other things that are going to be impactful in the near future? Yeah. I mean, I, Outside of AI, I, ha I haven't, te technologically speaking, I haven't seen a lot. Um, uh, I haven't seen a lot out there as of yet. Um, I think I think it's going to come down to how adaptable brands are 
for their customers, whether it's AI or some other innovation or technology. I think it's going to come down to who can adapt the quickest, who can ad adapt um, the best in order to serve the customer. So I think wh whether it's technology based, whether it's AI, whether it's something totally different, um, I think it's just going to come down to who can adapt the quickest. Um, you know, so when we talk about like early adoption, so I think the early adopters, when we talk about brands that are competing, the early adopters, as it's always been the case, are going to have the quickest success or the earliest success versus the later adopters. Um, as long as what they're adopting works, obviously. <laughs> but, but I think that, you know, uh, brands that are competing against each other, the early adopters and whatever technology it is, are going to, um, you know, see the fruits of their labors uh, quicker because of that adaptability. So I think it just got, it's going to come down to who's adapting, who's not adapting, who's changing, who's making things easier for their employees, making things even more so important, easier for their customers, um, are, are the ones that are going to have the success versus, versus others. And again, it comes down to having uh, experts that can help you decipher on, uh, you know, so that way you're not overwhelmed with, hey, this is the shiny new object this week. This is what I want to buy from my contact center. And then next week is something totally different, you know. So being able to really uh, uh, boil down onto, okay, what is, of all the different things that we can implement and buy for our contact center, what is the best for us, for our customers, for our employees, and then move forward from there. You know, what's great about what you just said is, you know, there's that theme of being proactive, but also that theme of expertise, right? And a lot of times we proactively go do things without the expertise, whether it's internal expertise or working externally with people that have expertise. And so then you're, you know, we think about that Goldilocks thing, right? It's right in the middle versus like the extremes of too hot, too cold. Um, and, you know, the too hot is where you have people that just go shiny object, let's go implement it and let's go full board. And we're going to do it in such a way that it's disruptive and painful. And your customers are going there. I can't call you. You don't respond via email. There's not a chat. There's like nothing. It's like a black hole and you never get back to me. I don't know how to get back to you. And then you got the wait and see approach, the cold side where it's the people are like, well, I'll wait till it's perfect. I'll wait till something really good is ready. Right. And then you have the people in the middle, they go, I'm going to find a safe place to test. I'm going to go get internal expertise. I'm going to work with external expertise and I'm going to go find a place so that I know how this works. I can go make it work well wherever I put it in and then I can expand it and I can start learning quickly and move on to adding this in other places. And so I think you're right is in the future, whatever the tech is, whatever the new process or even customer expectation is, are you finding a balanced approach to being proactive enough but also not forgetting that there's going to be some level of expertise internally and externally that if you don't have it, you're probably going to learn by more mistakes that you make versus ones you could have learned from others. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I agree for sure. I love the Goldilocks uh, uh, perspective. That's perfect. So we're running out of time. I know this conversation go on forever. I'm looking forward to the next time we can talk, but we got to shift to personal a little bit. Um, All right, let's do it. You know, You've kind of talked about recently on some posts about goals and financial goals and wellness, professional growth. Um, I understand you also do cycling. And I think you had a goal, what, like 3,000 miles, running 1,000 miles, reading 40 books. I mean, like you got all these goals, which is great. Now, how did you come up with these goals? How are you doing towards those goals? And what are these goals or having these kinds of goals done for you personally and professionally? Yeah, so... um so number one, it's helped with being disciplined, especially as an entrepreneur, uh, being disciplined because, you know, when you work in the corporate world, there's these expectations others have of you. Um, so you're kind of, you stick with a specific schedule or a specific type of work. Uh, going out on my own, it's kind of like, if I want to sit and play video games all day, besides my wife getting mad at me, like, well, what's the ramifications, you know? Um, so it's definitely helped with discipline and staying motivated on the days where I'm doing the tasks that aren't as exciting for me. Um, and, you know, over the last, was it five years? Since between 2019 and now, I've lost uh, 140 pounds. And that's really what's triggered the, um, uh, especially the wellness goals, like the cycling, the running, where, you know, five years ago, I couldn't go up a flight of stairs without having to stop to catch my breath. Or have a conversation walking up a flight of stairs. Um, 
And then even this type of, I'm sitting down, even this type of interaction, I would have been out of breath. Uh, so, so, um, so that's kind of what triggered those goals. I've always had goals, but they've been different. Um, uh, so yeah, so I, last year I had my first, I think it was last year, I had my first cycling goal, running goal, uh, reading. Uh, reading, I've had a goal every year for probably the last 10 years, but how many books I want to read. And, uh, and yeah, so I just started a couple of years ago. I think in 2022, actually, was the first year where I had personal goals, um, financial goals, and then uh, what I call like, so professional, personal, uh, and then uh, financial and wellness goals. So like, you know, want to be able to lift a certain amount of weight or run a mile in under a certain amount of time. So uh, like, like I mentioned towards the beginning, I've always been really focused on um, being challenged. I like to challenge myself and that's just additional ways that I like to challenge myself is by having these different goals. That's awesome. And I think you're right. When I run into people in both work, personal and, um, you know, just networking life, when you find people that have goals or they have hobbies or they have these things that they can pour this energy and passion and purpose into, right? Um, your, uh, it, it aligns very well with your JEP, uh, methodology, uh, in the personal life as well, um, that, um, uh, it seems to be a big driver, uh, for a lot of the things that affect even their professional side of it. You know, what you do personally, uh, has a massive impact on what you can and will do, uh, in your professional side. So that's fantastic. And, you know, you've kind of talked about, you've always had the books and more recently, you know, the health side and the, and the financial side, but. Is there something outside of someone just saying, just go make goals for yourself? What are those motivations that continuously make you say, I have to go out and I got to do these things? And then how does that affect and even influence how you're coaching and mentoring people? Yeah, yeah. So I perform better under pressure and when I'm challenged. So because of that, I'm always um, looking for, I'm being present, but looking forward to like the next event or the next thing like when i lost all that weight i beat a few diseases that i was battling and it was the the diseases diseases were there because of the obesity um and so so like now i do all the cycling do all this running but it's because you know like june 1st i'm doing a 15 mile hike so right now i'm training my legs for that hike and then you know in july i'm running a fourth of july morning race so I'm always like, I set these goals because I want to accomplish these goals because it's things that I haven't ever been able to do in my life previously, especially around the fitness. And, um, but then it's always like, oh, I'm training for this next event. So there's something like I'm looking forward to, or it's like, Hey, I really want to be able to get on stage and one, one pant size less by my speaking events in July or whatever it might be. So setting these different, um, targets. Uh, like, like if I were to sit down and say, I'm going to do 200 outreaches today. If I set it at 200, I will challenge myself and sit here all day until I hit 200 outreaches on LinkedIn. If I sit down this morning and I say, I'm going to do some outreaches today. I'll probably stop at like 60 and be like, sweet. I did 60 outreaches today. When, if I put challenge myself to 200, I would have hit 200 or stuck with it until. So, so for, for me personally, I need to have that. If I don't put that challenge on me or that pressure on me then I'm not going to get as much accomplished as I normally would. Plus, it's fulfilling to see like, oh, you know, I want to run, walk, hike a thousand miles this year. I want to cycle 3000 miles, read 40 books. So then when I'm able to like mark off another book read, it's like I'm that much closer to hitting those goals. Yeah, I love how, you know, sometimes big audacious goals or goals that have a lot of time to get to, they become and feel impossible, right? Without being able to distill them down to micro steps. And I love these micro goals you're talking about where you're saying, yeah, I'm going to get to this, you know, uh, big hike in six months, but to get there, I got to do this every day. Did I do it every day? Do I get that, that joy and fulfillment of accomplishing every day, which is awesome. And look, we've run out of time. I loved having you on. I look forward to the next time we have a conversation. Absolutely. Appreciate the insights, right? And for all of you uh, in our audience, you're going to want to get a hold of Milan. How do they go about doing that? Yeah, they can uh, email me, um, uh, Milan at MilanMotivates.com. Find me on LinkedIn. Um, I post almost daily during the week on LinkedIn, so I'm sure they'll be able to locate me, find me. Um, I'm here in Madison, Wisconsin, so if they're local, they can just drive around till they find me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, they can find me for sure. It'll be easy. Or the, or the next local storm, they may run into you. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next tornado near you. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, look, for our listeners, we'll be back next month with an, uh, another episode of First Contact Stories of the Call Center. We're going to be diving into more inspirational stories and talking to great leaders like Milan. So until then, let's all continue to work towards our goals. Let's remain focused and embrace the journey. So thanks for tuning in.